Hey guys, Jacob here and welcome to the new episode of Automated Seller Podcast. Today I have a new special guest, Burak Yolga. Hi Burak, how are you? Hi man, thank you for having me. Sure, sure, it's awesome and I'm glad that you are here. So uh, Burak, you are the co-founder and CEO of ForceGet, which is the supply chain logistics. And today I would love to talk uh, basically about your role, about your company and also about your past. So uh, Burak, maybe we'll start basically with the past, right? Uh, we already had a little bit of the conversation behind the scenes, but I would love uh, also our audience to, to, to hear it because I think it's pretty awesome. So if you could maybe share yes. a little bit um, your background, like what right. did you, how, how did you start and actually end up um, building ForceGet? Uh, thank you for having me, man. It's really interesting to uh, talk to you and your audience. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, for me, um, the journey was painful. Um, you know, a lot of people... Uh, they think that you are here today because, you know, um, you just like build this company. But I, I have so many failures. Um, <laughs> I, I've been living in Miami, Florida the last five years. Uh, before that, I lived in China eight years. That's, I think, where my journey starts. Um, you know, I was born in Istanbul, Turkey. I, I studied international business. Then <clears throat> I did my MBA in Paris, France. And then I, I lived in Czech Republic, like Prague, for six months. I worked for a British company. But then everyone back then, they had like an American dream and I had an Asian dream. You know, I always like, <laughs> and then back then, like it was 2011, 2012, where the Chinese economy, the GDP was growing double digit. You know, they were like manufacturing a lot of things. It was very interesting for me. I, I had no one in my family actually doing business and I was just like interesting. And I found an internship in China for six months and then I ended up staying like eight years. Uh, but, you know, it was very different because I didn't have any experience i didn't have any money um you know let, I, let me I, jump here real quick Burak, actually right. for for this chinese because i know that uh, sometimes uh, people tend to have a very long answers and i am actually very curious about this chinese e ex experience right like you said that you, you you had an internship there but but how is it actually to be in china does it require like to have a visa because you said that you spend up there a few yeah. few years later right, right? like interesting question because you know back then it was a little easier uh you know i i only had like a turkish passport Mm -hmm. And I, I I got a six months visa and it was this world's largest golf resort actually. So back then still like I had no business connection. And in Turkey, I always worked in the hotels in the resorts, like in the custom relationships and stuff. So I found an internship there. And then it was like six months visa. But then I get a job in a Chinese American company in the sales department. That's where they sponsor a work visa. And I think things a little changed after COVID. Uh, it's still like now things are going back to normal, more like getting a visa in China. But now, you know, the economy is not as encouraging as when I started. Even when I started, you know, Alibaba was there. There was like so many different platforms and trade shows, which uh, I think it got me really interesting because I lived in a city called Shenzhen. Uh, if people know, it's really right across from Hong Kong, like 45 minutes by subway or bus. And it's like two hours from Guangzhou where the Canton Fair takes place. So I was in the middle of uh, electronic centers, the, you know, the largest electronic companies like Huawei, uh, Oppo, like all these companies are in, in Shenzhen. So it's like a growing open-minded city, but biggest challenge was like, I didn't speak any Chinese. So, you know, you take I was it. about to ask that actually. <laughs> yeah. Like I have zero, zero, zero Chinese. And before I moved there, the person who did an internship with me was asking me if I like Chinese food. I was like, yeah, sure. But the food in there, like extremely different. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the first six months I lost around like 15 kilos because majority of the oh, meals, really? like, yeah, majority of the meals were like fried rice, fried noodle, you know, the hotel yeah. that I worked. It was like craziest time. But it was very interesting because, you know, I could travel back then. You know, I had no team. I was just like me, myself. Like, you know, I had not really much responsibility. It's still like a student life. It was interesting. But it's then also I, crazy that, that you just there, went there on your own. I think yeah, that's like yeah. very brave. <laughs> I, you know, like right now I'm looking. I was lucky. I was brain. I was stupid. Mix of everything. Um, but I think the, the majority of, you know, the most important thing for me was it was a very active lifestyle. I, I always like to be active in my life, you know. I don't like the word entrepreneur too much. Um, if you are good at something, if you want to learn something, that's what makes you who you are. And I always, I was always into <clears throat> international background, business, maybe money. You know, every, all of us have different sort of uh, motivation. And mine was this. 
and traveling, meeting suppliers, understand what is happening behind. It just like, it was so interesting because I would always think that, okay, I have a Samsung monitor in front of me. It's made by Samsung factory. When I went to the factories in China, I'm like, this doesn't look like the factories I saw in National Geography or something, you know, like in the, in the TVs. I'm like, is it really factory? I was like shocked where people oh, wow. products are manufactured, like what way. And, you know, it was you just mean like, in a good way or in a bad way, in a bad way, in a good way. Also, I learned so many things about like, you know, what is white label, what is OEM, what is ODM, mm -hmm. um, you know, the products that you buy in the market, it comes to you within four or five different tiers through different trade companies, like importers, exporters. It just like still I'm amazed of this entire process. You know, when you place the order, you send the money. The product is made by a factory or, or trade companies. And, the, and uh, you know, the way of doing business now is very different than mm -hmm. 10 years ago. I can't believe it's been 10 years, but um, I feel a little older as well. Um, I'm only <laughs> 35 years old, by the way. Don't think that I'm very old. Um, but, you know, right now, majority of these factories or manufacturers or trade companies, they do business directly in the end to end. You know, they, they're in the D2C marketplaces. They sell on Amazon directly. Oh, really? Um, the the yeah. factories itself. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny because we were looking to reach out to big brands uh, on Amazon side. Majority of our customers are Amazon. We downloaded the brand analytics report for outdoor and um, furniture. 80% of the top three click brands are Chinese brands. That's wow. crazy. But, 80%. But, but... Burak, uh, I, f I think that that was about to to end like end up like this. I mean, if you think about it, also, I feel like dro drop shipping, for example, it, it's it's no, I wouldn't say it's that that still like people doing it right and and getting a lot of money, but it's almost impossible to start just a drop shipping business nowadays, right? And if the yeah. factories are selling just on their own on, on <clears throat> popular marketplaces, then it's it's game over. Like there's no really margin that you Absolutely. can have. Yeah, I mean, it's so true because sometimes, you know, um, I actually create, um, I have a YouTube channel now, it's uh, called Forsket. Um, and in, in my video, I explain actually how to find if you go to Amazon, you do a research, let's say you do a product research from Helium 10, like, you know, if it is profitable or not, you can actually go click on the product, then click on the storefront. Under the storefront, Amazon is actually displays uh, the the seller's origin address, mm -hmm. the name, mm -hmm. last name, <clears throat> et cetera, address. So you can see if they're from China or not. Then if you are trying to enter to a, um, you know, product category where Chinese manufacturers or suppliers are heavily involved then you have pretty much no chance and it's like so funny because one of our customers they used to import uh meal worms you know the one kind of dry meal like the meal the dry worms that used for birds feeding chicken yeah. in the farms and stuff so this was like four years ago the factory saw that this guy's making a lot of sales on amazon they basically start increasing the price of his customer like slowly Mm -hmm. And they start selling with their own brands on Amazon directly. They're oh, like, wow. why should we make 20% to selling to a wholesaler versus we could make 60% margin? And that was an insane story because in some point, they had an agreement that they need to buy a certain amount. So this guy lost $200,000 because he put down payment deposit. So like sourcing and finding the good supplier is one of the hardest part right now. So there are so yeah. many companies are shifting selling on Amazon to like multi channels or different marketplaces. I think game has changed a lot, but at the same time you need to have a clear way of calculating your landing cost. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the most important in managing your inventory. Um, I so think I think also Burak, what, what I've seen, especially here in Poland, like Amazon, for example, it's it's not that big in Poland. It's getting there, um, but like I have a lot of friends who are um, selling their uh, like especially um, like T-shirts and so on, so um, clothes. And I asked them actually also about the quality. They said it's very good, and then they said that for them it's cheaper to have the manufacturers in Poland right now. Right. That they actually do it here because. If they also calculate all of the costs of like shipping uh, and so on, that they, there's really less margin, right? So I, I see this, and actually I see it more often. I don't know what are your thoughts about this. Um, would it be a trend actually to to start 
manufacturing also in other countries than China? If also they right now are putting their products on, on marketplaces. You know, we, we actually had a call with our one of our key customers. Uh, they are one of the largest air fryer and mini oven seller on Amazon in the US and Canada. So we're talking about the same thing. And answer is depending on the product. But in my opinion, still China is going to be the biggest player mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, product sourcing. Uh, people talk about Mexico. I don't think Mexico, except a couple of different uh, product categories, they say maybe textile, maybe some plastic or wood products, like they don't have enough capacity to support companies. They don't have enough infrastructure with their export um, export regulations. Um, it's very hard to export from Mexico. You have no idea. Sometimes it takes two to three weeks to clear the customer and then you need to pay a lot of money and then you know, products you manufacture in Mexico only can go through um, truck to US and full truck can cost up to like seven to $10,000 versus container now, like with the, even the price increase like 5,000. So I don't believe in people saying, oh, go source from Vietnam, go source from Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, but like how? Raw material <laughs> still comes from some of those countries, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe the, the production equipment, the packing material, uh, I am not heavily supporting China, but same time, uh, you need to be realistic uh, to understand like what other countries you can source. Some people like blindly uh, started to promote Mexico or India, but then you know we spoke to an Indian uh, supplier. We asked them to provide us the packing list and performing invoice. They were like, "Oh, what's performing invoice?" There are a lot of great Indian exporters. I'm not saying there are not, but <clears throat> there are also a lot of new starters. By anyone you want to go and buy product from China, they will be like, yes, we know everything. Like, you know, they're all, all star. Totally. There are a lot of companies, there are a lot of countries now they're still rookie in the market. Totally. But no, th thanks a lot for, for the opinion. Now let, let's get back actually to, to your uh, journey, right? So you got all of this experience and then you, you started first get, right? So tell me, uh, Burak, how, how is it to actually start the supply chain logistics business? How, how was your beginnings? How did you get a client? What were the initial services that right. you actually were doing and, and how is it now? But my, my actually the international logistic was the last layer, last tier of my business model, business uh, journey, because I, after my internship is over in that hotel, six months, I started doing sourcing, like, you know, for the clients, most of my customers were from Turkey, Italy, uh, Dubai, Kazakhstan, and other marketplaces. I start going to trade shows. I meet people. Every time I travel, I would go to overseas. I was doing a lot of like security cameras, home appliances and stuff. So I'd meet people, give business cards and try to like, you know, get business and start sourcing. So I started getting start sourcing business worth the mod and through friends. And, you know, I, my first order was like very small, 400 uh, units, uh, car DVRs. <laughs> and then you know, uh, sometimes factories start introducing me to their customers and, you know, I start working with the companies and then I decided to start focusing on a couple of products that I can trade myself. So I would manufacture in China and then market them. You know, I mm -hmm. think that's the biggest difference. I think chi like manufacturers in China versus maybe let's say Europeans or like, a, or expats, we know how to market the product. They know how to manufacture the product. Mm -hmm. And now they're learning how to market the product also. That's like a big danger. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I start do that. And now my customers start asking me, hey, can you also help us with the shipping? Because I would sell them a full container of meat grinder or leggings or, you know, computer keyboards. Then they're like, hey, you know, you're sourcing the product. Can you help us with the international shipping? So I started an international shipping company. It was a small one. And then it started growing. And then five years ago, I right before COVID, I was like, you know, I want to expand to a different marketplace because my knowledge and my business relationships in China is only worth of my competitors because, you know, everyone would compete. Everybody would compare my service with other sourcing companies from China or, you know, freight companies in China. I'm like, I want to differentiate myself. So my knowledge worth better in North America. So I should kind of move here, start in here. So I yeah. decided to come to Miami, Florida, because I wanted to live somewhere in a warm place. You know, New York and stuff's not for me. And the West Coast had like <laughs> I, I just been there recently. Yeah, it, it's yeah, a cold it's place. Like, it's not fun. And then West Coast has too much time difference with China and Turkey because I was like connected with my office. And then I I, I picked Miami. I'm very happy. 
uh, where I live, there are a lot of uh, open-minded people, entrepreneurs, um, and it's easy to fly in and out. We have a company right now in Medellin, Colombia. Also, we have sales team in Chicago. We have a warehouse in Los Angeles. So it's like a good spot for me to like fly in and out. That's how we started. And then we, two years ago, we were the first company who built this digital platform. People can track their shipments online for e-commerce and Amazon sellers. We call mm -hmm. it Forescape Digital Freight Forwarder, where now we are working on Amazon seller central connections and Shopify this way companies have the full visibility in their entire 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 international shipping as well as uh inventory management so i think it's gonna be something very very cool um and now we're mainly focused on like a large seven eight figure brands who globally selling we are partnered with amazon uk and europe as well as canada um and you know a couple of other big companies like fratos alibaba so you know, we have a great team in the back end. Everybody works like its own company. Uh, we have a lot of like remote people. We have a lot of like mm -hmm. offices. So I'm, I'm actually very happy in the industry that we're in, which brings the question mark is what is going on with this year in the, you know, supply chain challenges. Oh yeah, totally. But, but yeah, I'm really glad that you actually shared also your, your, your client persona, especially right now that you said that it's a focus for seven, eight figures uh brands and, and amazon i was about to ask that right and uh we, we already also talked a little bit about the conferences as, as i said i saw your booth um last year and uh that's actually very funny that now we have a podcast together it's super right. cool to also see this uh but yeah burak uh, I, I wanted to ask you um, actually right now about this client's uh acquisition strategies right so if you could maybe share um obviously re recommendation is one right you're doing great job uh people are willing to to refer you it's same for our business but especially uh with, with such a competition um for example let's focus maybe on the first right if, if you go into the first a lot um trade shows what's your strategy there right like how, how do you attract new customers because i i mean I, i've seen some of the also other logistics companies right so those are potentially your competitors or like right. directly your competitors. Right. So. You know, it's, 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 it's very hard because there's so much competition in the market. But I think one thing that differentiates us is uh, when we get into different communities, because people really, if they are happy with your service, they talk about you to other people. Mm -hmm. If they're not talking, if they're not happy with your service, then they talk more about you to the, you know, their community, <laughs> their, their, their friends and families. And that's one thing that we, I think, successfully implement, um, trying to get into. And anytime we make a mistake or anytime there's something went wrong, uh, we took the responsibility. I think that's why we grew like 200% last year. It was, which oh, wow. was like a difficult, yeah, it was a really growth year for us. We built a lot of SOPs. Uh, we made a lot of maybe mistakes internally, but every time we made a mistake maybe or something went wrong and we're in the industry that's a lot of things are happening outside of our control unfortunately you know the delays may be something damaged but we always like did our best to help the clients to explain what is the really happen and these kind of things can happen and now what is the compensation we always try to cover the you know either cost of the damaged things or loss so we put people in the right contact with the right people we share with them entire communication I think eventually that's what I learned right now in our, in our business. Anything can go wrong, but you got to be like hundred percent honest. And then, you know, we have a lot, we have our, we have our team is almost like 50, 55 people right now. And sometimes each individual can make a mistake. We're all human. Yeah. And then, you know, as a company owner, I need to take responsibility. Even if we need to lose money, we just like tell the, tell people the truth, you know? Um, and I think our platform, I, I believe in the transparency our, our Forsket uh, software where people can track their shipments online online, and it doesn't matter what their location is. I think makes people life easy. If you if there's a problem, there should be a solution. So we're trying to find the solution parts, like how we can solve people's problem. What is their biggest challenge right now? If you want to grow bigger, expand better, um, what kind of question marks you have in your head? And we're trying to answer them before actually people ask like you know because people search things and we want to be there to help and create value for for the clients i think it's all about creating value for the client
Totally, totally. No, I really, I really like it. Um, I really like it. Also, like the the platform. I think this is like a definitely a game changer, right? So you you said that you have this digital platform that your clients can pretty much log in and see all of their uh, shipment, shipment and Warehouse location, movements, inventories, everything. I, I, I think it's 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 really a game changer then. Especially uh, now, you know, because I know that some people they keep talking about the PPC budgets increasing and you know PPC bidding is much higher. Mm -hmm, uh, totally. But they are managing their PPC budget not according to their inventory movements, mm -hmm. which is the biggest problem right now. And you know, Forskit is the one who started this actually um, trend, like telling people, look, you need to know where's your shipment to make a better decision to place a new order to your supplier, to your 3PL, the PPC agent. We kind of give access to everyone in our platform. So a lot of people, they have like their virtual assistants, suppliers, um, Amazon agencies, sometimes like two, three different parties needs to have oh, yeah. access to the same information. So we, we make that happen. That's, that's awesome. I think that overall right now, it just get selling on Amazon. It's more and more competitive. I mean, right now I, I, I've had a lot of interviews also with like Amazon, uh, agency owners, right? They, they mentioned that, uh, it's much harder right now to, uh, run the ads. It's it's no longer that you just run the ads and uh, people buy your products, right? So yeah, it's all about reviews. Now, you tell me that here it's also uh, like the next factor is actually to, to keep track of the lo logistics because eventually you need your stock to be refilled also on time. Then the other price, uh, the, the other point is uh, the pricing point, like having a right repricer. Then uh, I had also people on my podcast who are running the um, like also the agencies, but more like on the, uh, content side, right. They, they write the listing, they prepare the SEO and so on. So it just seems that this, this, uh, selling on Amazon nowadays, is just, you need to do so many things right to, to stay ahead of the competitors. You know, I think another thing is direct, um, connection is the cash flow because one of the biggest problem people haven't lost here is having the access to the cash, having the access to capital mm -hmm. because the interest rates are very high. 2021, 2022, no one had that kind of problem. Aggregators were like throwing out money. Now they all oh, yeah. bankrupt, unfortunately. <laughs> um, you know, the market conditions are like very different. So even if you have a good idea, maybe you don't have money to launch this. <clears throat> and this is a lot of, that's a big problem for people to, you know, maintain their business. And not knowing when is your shipment departing from the origin, not knowing when is it arriving, you can't even make a decision about increasing, decreasing your prices, activating deactivated coupon. Everything is related to your best selling rank if you're selling on Amazon. And if you make a small mistake, you run out of inventory, it's pretty much end of the game because Amazon really do care that you never run out of inventory. They care about sales history. And now they even came up, they came out with an announcement that you need to have an average, uh, you need to keep an average quantity that you're selling last 12 months, always in the FBA fulfillment center, because there are so many companies, they run out of inventory. So it's basically like end of the game if you don't manage your inventory well. And now we see average two weeks of delay uh, shipment mm -hmm. apart from China which, with few particular carrier. And I really think that it's just, uh, I really think that it's like the most crucial decision-making process right now. What inventory do you have, when it's going to arrive, and what is your landing cost? Because uh, eventually it's important to have a profitable business. It's, it doesn't matter anymore how much you're selling revenue because, oh, yeah. you know, that's so many people, they forgot about that last two years and then now they're getting suffering. Yeah, totally. And now, uh, Burak, I, I want to challenge you here a little bit and pretty much uh, talk a little bit about um, like advantages and disadvantages of using um, basically a third party logistics company like, like yours for the Amazon business, because obviously uh, it's not for everyone, right? Like right. You, you need to basically qualified for it as a, as a seller. So maybe you can tell actually what would be like the qualification for the seller when it's the right time to actually start thinking about the third party, logis third party logistics partner and when definitely it's not. Um, you know, I, I, I think that people, so I think we could consider that within two different categories. 
uh, people who already been selling on Amazon or other marketplaces last couple of years, which they saw that the game has changed a lot because almost 70 to 75 percent of Amazon sellers, they think that selling on Amazon is harder. That's like a fact. Um, you know, Amazon also makes it harder for Amazon sellers to sell on Amazon, but they want the brands to sell on Amazon. You know, that's like the, the idea because Amazon also create their Accelerate uh, event in Seattle. Um, that's the one time in a year Amazon organizes to bring together like 2000 brands that the top selling brands on Amazon. So that's the, the majority of companies that we focus on because we were the only international logistic company who had a booth in Accelerate 2023. And I think if you are believe in- uh, That's where I saw you, Dave. Maybe, Accelerate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got yeah, it. Yes. So yeah, Accelerate was a great event for 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 us to meet you know large Amazon brands that who are serious about that. Um, there, if you're an Amazon seller, if you want to start selling on Amazon, you have two three SKUs. Maybe you should try to find a way to ship it to Amazon directly, uh, versus mm -hmm. trying to you know work with a three PL who has like you know international shipping plus fulfillment because you know you will have like a higher cost. And if you are not importing large quantity, all these extra costs is going to increase your uh, landing cost per, per unit. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are ordering 1,000 units per time versus 10,000 units, your landing cost will be much more expensive uh, for a bigger seller. So um, I think people should be like focusing on the correct business model for their business if they are just starting. Um, I think that's the biggest uh, difference between using the 3PL freight forwarder versus not to understand where are you today with your business? There's no problem to be small. Uh, we have a client there selling like a tactical bags uh, for, you know, uh, different kind of uh, products like camping, maybe weapons and stuff. It's it's high quality made. Uh, Amazon, like a retail price, like $100, $125. And they have 3000 reviews, which is the ratings 4.9. So if there's a niche you want to sell, you don't have to sell 1,000. You could make something good quality if there's a demand. Oh, yeah. Make it quality and then, you know, you can sell it. Because a lot of companies, also starters, I, I think there's one thing that if, if you're serious about that, don't start selling anything below $30. You can't make any money. FBA fees, buying costs and everything. You should start you should start on a something like a higher margins, higher selling yeah. point, something between start selling something plus $90, $100, $110. You would buy that for 30 units. Uh, sorry. You, you can buy that around like FOB price, 25 to $30, but then competition is going to be less. But if you position yourself, if you market, if you expand, you can make better money. That's my yeah. personal opinion right Which now. Which means profit eventually, right? Yeah, but absolutely. Because otherwise you pay to Amazon, you pay to supplier, you pay the 3P out. There's nothing left for you, like PPC. You know, yeah. Google Google advertisement is double the cost, like Amazon double the cost, like PPC. So it's impossible to make money if you're selling a product for twenty dollar. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sure some people make money from twenty, but like, it's harder. That's that's why that's my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for this. Definitely, I, I've heard actually, yeah, from also a few other uh, leaders in this um, Amazon community that it's 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 super hard right now to compete yeah. also on those l lower prices items. So that that's for sure. And now, Burak, I want to talk a little bit also about uh, like the most important days uh, for Amazon sellers, right? So days like Amazon Prime Day or the Black Friday. Uh, you already said that having items in a stock um, so you can actually fulfill all, your, all of the orders, it's crucial, right? And right. If, you, if, you, if you don't do that, then you can just pretty much uh, lose with your competitor overnight. Right. So how Amazon sellers should uh, get, actually get ready for those important days? Mm -hmm. Like there, there's also like some other days like seasonality, right? Like Christmas, for example, where certain items go high. Like so overall, all of those seasonal days, like wh what's your approach? You know, I, 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 I am not very good at looking at the data, but I know that's very important. Um, you know, I'm more in the, in our company, I'm more in the marketing and sales and operations side, whereas my sister, she's another co-founder. Luckily she's very good at like software and finance. Obviously I look at it, but you, you, I think knowing your numbers is the most important thing right now. And if you're not mm -hmm. good at it, you need to find someone who can assist you. And knowing your numbers means not only like a landing cost and everything, but like forecasting to have a better forecasting and understanding that things are delaying a lot. Like, you know, if you place an order from China, 
the, maybe the production time is not 30 days anymore. It is 45 days. The shipping time is not 30 days anymore. It's 45 to 50 days. Amazon Fulfillment Center's checking time is not 10 days. It's 30 days. That's where I mentioned about the cash flow. It, it Like two years ago, before COVID, you would order a product in China. You start selling it. You sell it. You collect the money in 90 days from Amazon. Now it's 180 days. You need to have a clear cash flow to like support this flow. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is the most important thing I think for this year to understand for people to know their numbers and understand and manage their cash flow and forecast. You look at the last two years data, the same time of the year, and also calculate the fact that like the inflation and other things, It's it sounds like complicated, but I think uh, it's important to understand like this relationship between the suppliers the shipments and the you know the selling it's the most important thing this year that's why uh mm-hmm. you know every day they're talking about this in the finance news and you know politic issues the company revenues can be affected from this supply chain disruptions oh yeah, oh, yeah. and i think yeah it's, it's all about also pre- pre- prediction uh so w- once you take a look at your data and the numbers and you know that uh in two months there might be a very high demand on your product then you just simply should order more right and and predict that uh so i i fully agree with you uh yeah burak thanks a lot uh that was actually very very nice and informative uh thank you episode uh last question that i have for you is pretty much how people can find you how people can uh, start working with the force get and uh yeah we're, basically um, it's youtube it's always, linkedin they can always like connect me directly um my email address is sales at it comes to me directly i like to see everything what's going on with the sales and operations they can always reach us out on our social media channels and we we i think we do a lot of cool content on youtube right now if they want to know more about like you know import regulations um you know chargeable weight sourcing from china other marketplaces so i'm talking about more like a supply chain you can always like track our youtube channel as well subscribe but the email address is the the best way and then you know i generally get back to everyone within two to three hours Awesome. Burak, thanks a lot for, Thank you for uh, this episode. Me, it, was, it was a really uh, great conversation. And we stay in touch. And Absolutely. thanks for watching, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.